Good morning. It's Tuesday, August 19th, 2014. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 45. My name is Chris, and we've got some good headlines, especially for those of you who've been waiting for your automated driving, like I have been. And to help me discuss this is our organized council of informed Internet citizens. Time appropriate greetings, Mumble Room. Time appropriate greetings. Whoa. Hi. Look at that. We've got a good showing in there today, a good group of folks today. Well, good morning, everybody. So uh, it's something that's been a thread going on through Tech Talk today since it started 45 episodes ago, and that's automated driving. Well, I think this is a huge step to actually it may be becoming a reality if everything works out. Uh, after more than a decade of research into different types of possible car-to-car communications, the U.S. auto safety regulators took a step towards unveiling a plan requiring cars to have wireless gear that will enable them to warn drivers of danger. These vehicle-to-vehicle transmitters and software won't be cheap, costing anywhere from about $340 to $350 uh, per vehicle starting in 2020. This is according to the National Traffic Safety Administration's report. Just two of the possible features rely on the V2V. It's called V2V. That's the uh, wireless technology that the cars use, vehicle-to-vehicle. V2V technology. One that warns drivers if they don't have enough time to make a left turn, and another that urges them to stop if the car is about to run a red light. They estimate this could prevent 25,000 to 592,000 crashes and save 49 to 1,083 lives annually in the United States if all vehicles were equipped with that with today's crash rates. Now, the other thing is the vehicle technology actually has been getting a lot better. So it might not actually, by the time we use this, save as many lives. That's kind of funny. The current V2V system is set up in such a way that it Cars swap messages 10 times per second about their position in space, which direction they are headed, and how quickly they are moving in that direction. If two cars are on a collision course, the driver can be presented a warning. Now, that's interesting. If it's broadcasting like that, I wonder what kind of information would be broadcasting to law enforcement. Could they just drive up next to you and get the exact speed from your car's computer and then ding you for that? Uh, But obviously, this is to lay in an infrastructure uh, to allow for automated driving and to mandate it in vehicles by 2020. Uh, this is not exactly finalized yet. Uh, they've, they've had about 3,000 vehicles out on the roads equipped with these V2V uh, communications technologies on regular, ordinary city streets. They've, uh, they've done them in like heavy communications areas where there's a lot of radio transmissions. Supposedly, uh, no problems there. Uh, they say the technology will be supplied by companies such as Cisco or Denisocorp, among other companies that might be able to manufacture these V2V chips and, and radios for the cars. Um, so, this is sort of a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because obviously you have to have something like this for a truly mesh net-like automated driving system that isn't reliant on a central server that could go down or be hacked or whatever, right? You, you really want the cars in their vicinity to be talking to each other, trading information, because there can be mechanical failure or something like that that's extremely local, regional, and immediate, and all of the cars around them will need to be able to react. So, we have to accept, then, that we need some sort of fairly low-level, fairly nitty-gritty communication systems between cars. But that obviously comes with a series of possible downsides. Cars are going to cost more. Um, Law enforcement will be able to read that information. There's those kinds of things. So, uh, Eric, you know, you, uh, when I think about commuting, I think about, like, whenever you come up to the studio, you've got a monster drive. What is that, like an hour and a half, two hours to get up to the studio? It's an hour and a half. So you got to think from time to time, boy, wouldn't it be nice if you could just press the button let the car take you, and then play on the tablet all the way up, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this is something we were talking about. Um, I was just this past Friday at the Think Big Festival in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And that is something that we actually that was actually discussed. We actually had a presenter talking about uh, automated driving. That was actually the first presentation. And we, we actually discussed quite a bit about it. And uh, it, there are actually cars that you can buy today that will drive themselves in heavy traffic. It's crazy. Oh. Uh, but but the benefit of having like this sort of system would be that they're all networked so that like it it creates like a uh, a fluid transportation, you know, it's it's almost like a a train. Right. It's it's a you know, yeah. Every car is communicating with each other so you travel at highway speeds in right. normal traffic. Right. In in think about it in in it sounds crazy, but if computers were controlling all of the cars, you wouldn't even need to stop at a stoplight. Right, because they would know exactly. the positions of all the cars. You would never have to slow down unless you needed to stop the vehicle to get out. It, I mean, it could, 
it could or add so much. Fire. So oh yeah, right, yeah. Or mechan- yeah, yeah, right. But I mean, like at stop signs and stoplights, those could become a thing of the past, and it could add such additional capacity to our roads without having to pave more, without having to add extensions. So totally, it's not well, just about safety. No, it's not just about safety. It's also about time where you could be spending talking with your family on a drive or something. Hmm. Or Absolutely. E- or even just getting work done while in your car. All right, let's bring it back so down. So I, I wanted to give PC Wiz a chance to chime in on his thoughts on the security aspect of this. Go ahead, PC well, Wiz. This all sounds great, but you've got a load of wireless communications going on all over all these different cars talking to each other. Yeah. How long is it until we walk in to see Black Hat just taking one of these cars and crashing them all over the place? Yeah, or what I was yeah. thinking about is maybe sending bogus data, because if you just told all the cars around you you were going perhaps much faster than you actually are, you would, or slower, you would cause in a chain reaction that could have lots of different consequences. So even well, just altering the data that you're transmitting. Like, right. Off the overflow of someone's car. Well, or there might be a way to convince other cars to come to a stop. So say you were going to do a kidnapping or something like that. Because it's not, I mean, let's be realistic here. If there eventually there will be people of a certain importance that will be riding these cars that could maybe be targets, right? And so... Oh. If you could manage all of the cars around them to come to a stop, then you could get in one person's car and, you know, grab them and then take off. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy things, but there's also just the ability to, you know, just cause chaos, and which would be enough for some people. Um, that's why you lock it down with all sorts of security. Right, and that's what I was just going to say. Is like There could be maybe some sort of verification signing process that they could implement. To sort I of think it has to be free software, though, because we need to be able to review stuff. I don't want to be driven around in a car with proprietary software. Well, and the other thing is, this is just for the U.S., right? We're just mandating this in U.S. cars. Uh, Europe could come up with their own solution, which wouldn't be unmanageable, but wouldn't be ideal. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i actually kind of, I'm hoping that this V2V system allows the foundation to have a fully interoperable, it has to be an industry-wide standard, right? It has to be something all the manufacturers are on board with. And totally, I guess, yeah. and it just has to be it's that way in all of, you know, uh, all regions, right? It doesn't have to be the same standard across the world, but at least for that region. It's pretty interesting. Uh, and uh, that means 2020 is when this communication... Now, who knows what functionality you'll get of that? You know, sometimes this stuff goes in and then nothing happens. You know, I've got one of... Yeah, everybody. Everybody that's got a car made since 96 has one of those onboard diagnostic ports. The What is it? The ODB... Whatever. Two ports. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Make up, make up letters. Well, you know what I've got in in it's just crazy. This that thing is a treasure trove of information. It, it it your car is aware if you're braking too hard, wearing down the brake pads too aggressively, if you're accelerating the more than what the engine is is it wants at that time. Your car is aware of all of this stuff, at least most cars <clears throat> all the time. And I got this little device called the automatic and it plugs into the port and then the port sends over Bluetooth LE. Cars have had powerful computers inside them for years, <gasps> but that hasn't really improved the way that we drive them. In creating Automatic, we set out to unlock our car's potential and redefine people's relationship to driving, wow. making it safer, more efficient, and wow. fun. This is we real? did this. Yeah, this is a th- so. Anyways, if you take out the uh, the crazy hipster music, uh, you put it in your ODB2 port, and then it connects to your uh, Bluetooth LE compatible smartphone, and then you get like if you've got an engine light. Uh, like a check engine light, it will read the code for you and you tell it to make a model of your vehicle and actually go get the translation for what that code means so you don't have to take him to the mechanic to read the code. So like me, I found out I've got an exhaust, I had an engine light, check engine light come on. Now that's all it tells me. And so is this a critical problem? Like do I have a like a hose leak that's going to you know cause me to have my engine shut down on me? Or is it something more minor? So using this, I was able to determine that it's an exhaust leak. Not the, I need to get it fixed, but it's, it's not going to leave me stranded on the side of the road, right? So okay, I can schedule that. And that for for that right there paid for the device, and now it, now it uh, it also uses your location and compares all the gas prices around you and tells you per trip uh, costs and uh, your fuel mileage. It also gives you a driving score depending on your braking and acceleration to tell you how well or bad you've been treating your vehicle. My point this is, is the future. <clears throat> it is exactly, and it's been in our cars since 1996, and they've done nothing with it. They've done nothing. It took some. It took some startup company to come around and say, well, hey, you know, everybody's got a really powerful computer in their pocket now, so maybe we could just use Bluetooth. And, and then they made this bridge, this device, that stays in your port all the time and talks to your smartphone. And but it's crazy amazing. cool. But, the, 
but that's the, the whole the whole thing. I mean, where, where show me the money? I mean, where who would benefit from this? Well, don't you uh, think you know, like uh, car man? Not automotive. Yeah, it, 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 maybe that's it. In some ways, it's it's in their benefit to keep us in the dark, so we have to go in. So, anyways, if you if you're curious, uh, you can get it automatic.com and if you go to automatic no no affiliation this is a they don't sponsor me i don't have any uh affiliate money but if you go to automatic.com slash atp um i think you get like 20 percent off so it's like uh it's like 80 bucks that's a really good deal yeah and that's a atp is a podcast that i've listened to so uh, it's automatic.com and if you want to help those guys out it's atp for the 20 percent off and i got one and i got one for my dad too and uh, now we compete on our driving score and I kick his butt. <laughs> I kick his butt. Mostly because I'm an old man. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. I got. I choked on my Coca-Cola before the show this morning. So here's one for uh, those of you who might be parents. I'd like to get your take on this one. Google is planning to offer accounts to children under 13 years of age. Now, this is some interesting territory. Now, on the news of this, uh, Google stock is up uh, over 4.5% uh, this morning. It's a big gain. Um, actually, according to this stock, ticker, it's down, but the one I just checked before the show said it was up. Anyways, Google plans to offer accounts to children under the age of 13 years of old for the first time, a move that will take the largest internet search provider into a controversial and operationally complex market, to put it lightly. Google and most other internet companies tread carefully because of the Children's Online Privacy Act, or COPA, the law imposes strict limits on how information about children under 13 is collected. It requires parents' consent and tightly controls how that data can be used for advertising. The company's new effort is partially driven by the fact that some parents are already signing their kids up for the company's service. So Google wants to make the process easier and compliant with the rules, the person said. And that part rings really true to me. I bet a lot of parents are doing that. Yeah, get a Gmail account, kid. Have an yeah, Android. Well, you know, I see this being a requirement more and more for school. Sure, so that too, yeah. Can, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I can see this mm -hmm. as being necessary overall because the kids are in school, they need to have I mean, you wonder what, so a kid under 13, what does he need a Google or she need a Google account for exactly? Uh, logging into the apps that they use at school on their, you know, tablets and stuff. I mean, I know, can see blah, it in the blah. Android space because once you're on Android, you pretty much have a Google account. So I can totally see, like, you get yeah. your kid a tablet. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think this is actually probably a good move on Google's part. And uh, it's it's a definitely something that uh, I kind of look at from a unique angle, not only as a parent, but also as somebody who spent many years working at a school district and dealing with a lot of this stuff. And when I was there last, it was just really when the schools were like, can we use Google Docs? Can we do that? So and, you know, they'd set up an apps account and had branded it. But there was still a lot of questions. And this kind of stuff will sort of put school districts minds at ease. Oh, and you know what the other big thing is, you guys, this might be the biggest thing of all of them that we're not even thinking about is Chromebooks are going like bananas in schools, right? Oh, yeah, big time. And how oh, good is a Chromebook right. without a Google account? It's no good, basically. But, but Chris, doesn't this scare you as a parent? Like, you're, you're basically conscripting your children, like, well, before what, they're even... What does literate? concern me about it is I have kind of made the choice that when, my, when it's time for my children to have an online presence, you know, my intention is to buy them a .com or whatever domain, maybe it's whatever, dot .whatever, totally, uh, yeah. have their own email address yeah. on our own server, right, and, and not have them use Gmail and things like that. Now, what I do not like is the idea that essentially, well, then he goes to school and they end up putting him on a Chromebook and he has to get a Google account anyways. At least yeah, it won't be I his mean, life account, but I just don't like it. And, I mean, that's you. I mean, you're, you're technically literate. I mean, imagine, like, the rest of, you know, the world that, you know, is, you know, Google conscripts. I mean, this is just like, I mean, it, oh, it's scary stuff. It is a little scary. I hate that uh, I hate that we're sort of just signing our kids up, um, you know, for this kind of stuff, and it's sort of an opt-in service. Uh, PC Wiz, what are your thoughts? The kids are just going to lie about the age like they have been doing anyway, so you might as well just... <laughs> <laughs> right, that's probably part of the problem they're fighting. Okay. I mean, I, I see where Google's at. Like, they're, they're in now to a market, and you know what? Like, the Chromebook is a good solution for schools. So if they could do this responsibly, the problem is, is what happens after they turn 13? Do all of a sudden they graduate? Does that record that they have collected while they were under 13, is that always associated with them? Because you have to think about some of this stuff. Like, kids going into school, if they start at the age of... I guess 10? What, I mean, what age are they targeting if they're doing under 13, 12, 11? Uh, if they create an account then, that may be the same account they're still using when they're 35. 
think yeah, about totally. the I mean, years is, of data and yeah. signals and just the entire personality profile they would have on a human being that's been using one account, feeding it full of all that information, and it's going to be more that they collect over time. I mean, they're only at the beginning of what they'll be able to collect. And that's starting at the age of, let's say, 10 to 35 yeah, or 40 or however long they use the account. It's Google, kind of a... Google, well, who, who will audit Google over this? Yeah, I don't know if there is some sort of audit uh, capacity to COPA or not. Yeah, it might be an honorary thing at that, where they are just, yeah, that's a good question. You know what? That's something I will do more digging on. I would that, that would, I would really like I to know that. I guess that would be my concern, yeah. yeah. For, I, I have a nine-year-old, and I, I really restrict on, you know, what he can do. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that is it. But that's the problem with Google, in, in, in essence, I mean, you know, in terms of like, you know, all of these, uh, you know, wearable technologies, you know, the Google Glass, uh, the, the watch, you know, blah, blah, blah. it's, you, you know, uh, who owns the future? I mean, you know, you're, you're an aggregate, you, you, you are the product, you know, your data is the product. Right. That, that I think a lot use. of people are still trying to kind of come to full terms what that means. I don't think people have sat down and thought about it a lot. And those of us who do, I think, are a little more bothered by it than those who haven't. I'm not... I might be wrong about that. It might just be a total value assessment that they've done, and it just doesn't hold the same value. Uh, I don't know. But, it, well, it, but the, I, thing, the thing is, like, you can't be that big and ever, like, I mean, wh who audits it? Like, it doesn't matter. It's Google. I right. mean, Google controls the world. They'll you just, know what yeah, I mean? They'll just, re they'll if, just if, legislate. If information, if information is power, then Google controls the world. Well, whoever That's has the biggest lobbyists, right? <laughs> 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 All right. Okay. You know, one oh. thing I was thinking is this is also beneficial for, like, homeschoolers because they're going to need those email addresses to yeah, work yeah. with whatever teachers they have remotely. And remember how, what was it, last week we had the Google identifying child porn? And now we yeah. have, I wonder if the timing of these two events is just a coincidence or if it's Google trying to put the message out there like, look how we're investing in children and protecting them. Like, it's just interesting we have these two stories essentially spaced out by the same amount of days. I don't know. Anyways, uh, while we're on the topic of uh, cheap laptops and Chromebooks, have you met the HP Stream, the $199 Windows laptop that's aimed squarely at the Chromebook market? Now, we knew Microsoft was going to do this. So the HP Stream is 14 inches. Uh, it shares basically a lot of features with Chromebooks. It has a 1366 by 768 display, for example. Uh, it, comes out, it has an energy-efficient, I should say, AMD chip. Uh, the uh, two gigabytes of memory for the system, and you can either get it in 32 or 64 gigabytes of flash storage. It also has an SD card slot, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and some USB ports, HDMI out, and a webcam. Uh, the HP 14 Stream will have four speakers and have Beats audio. It'll be 3.9 pounds and run Windows 8.1. The $199 laptop. Anybody want to buy this? I need my Beats audio. That's all I need. Well, it might make a good <laughs> Linux box. Um... I wonder if it would be easier to put Linux on this in the Chromebook since you don't have that weird BIOS thing where you have to go into developer mode. I wonder if I wonder what that would look Ooh, like. That's a good point. Yeah. That's a super good point. This could be easier that Linux boxes. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Now let's just yeah, drool. We got before we get last two more stories, then we got to run because we're getting we're getting a little long here. But this I just wanted to drool with you guys. I I love me a good display. Oh my gosh, I love me a good display. And LG is flaunting. Get this, a 21 by 9 aspect ratio monitor. If they say it's a display for gamers. Uh, one will be 4K at that. They're curved. If you're looking at the video version, you can see the curve. This is kind of the new hotness. Here's, uh. here's one of the models, 34 inch. This is the 34UC97. It's a curved monitor with the cinematic 21.9 aspect ratio with in-pane switching, which gamers love. Uh, it boasts a massive 3,000. 440 by 1,440 resolution. It comes with two Thunderbolt ports uh, and allows you to daisy chain to under other Thunderbolt devices. I would assume that also means it works under DisplayPort. Interesting that it ships with Thunderbolt, though. No uh, word on price or availability yet. And there is also Excellent. another monitor that uh, is a little cheaper, and CNET covers that one. But, oh, my gosh. When you put, I was like, a curved display, huh, that's interesting. Okay, maybe, because I do sit kind of close to a monitor. That might make sense, because I didn't make so much sense on a TV across the room. But a monitor, I'm only a few feet in. But then, then you stack three of them next to each other. <gasps> that's so beautiful. Yeah. That's so beautiful. I just, I, I, I shed a tear. I'm not kidding. All right, everybody, go uh, launch your podcast network because it looks like things might be settling down. Adam Carolla is settling his lawsuit with the podcast patent troll, Personal Audio. You guys, uh, I don't know if you remember from the episode we covered a little bit ago, but uh, Personal Audio came out and said, ah, we're dropping our case. 
Well, it, it sounds like there might have been still a few more attachments that they had to work out. We don't know a lot because they're in a quiet period right now. So this is coming from some speculation that Slashdot is linking to. But essentially, we can speculate that Corolla didn't have to pay personal audio anything. Uh, they might have settled a couple of other things. And now they've both agreed to end the case. Uh, and they call it, uh, they ended it with, uh, without uh, aggression or something. They, where, they, the, where they end it, it means that it's potential it could be reopened in the future, but not likely. That's called without prejudice. Yes, thank you. That was it. Uh, and Corolla, Corolla's team also is trying to go after personal audio for the press release they released a couple of weeks ago when they said that they were giving up on the lawsuit because they said that that violated uh, a, uh, like a quiet period that they were under. And by doing so, they were influencing the case. So now they're trying to get them sanctioned for that or whatever the term is. It's all legal stuff. That, but the part that matters is, is Corolla is dropping the suit against Personal Audio. Personal Audio is dropping the suit against Corolla and all the other podcasting networks. But nothing has been legally decided. Everybody's essentially deciding to pull out. Now, I don't know what happens. I don't know if that means Corolla blew through the $500,000 that he raised. Uh, because in, it's interesting. It, it, in some cases, it sounds like they hadn't gone to those funds yet. It sounded like Adam had financed it personally and then was going to replenish his personal funds from the, the audience money. I'm not sure exactly how that worked. I'm sure people who probably listen more often to Corolla know. Either way, this is good at least for the time being because essentially if, they, if personal audio ever wanted to reopen this and go after podcasters again, they'd have a pretty hard case to make since they just closed this one down. It doesn't mean they couldn't do it, but for now at least you can thank Corolla, if nothing else, for settling this matter for probably a few years until somebody's making a ton of money. Uh, until Leo Laporte says something about the millions he's making, and then they'll go after Leo Laporte. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying that might happen. Uh, you never know. He says things like that. It's for people who Leo. like to mess with computers. If you're, and you know who you are. If you're somebody who doesn't want to mess with it, I just want to search. I just want to buy something on Amazon. Send an email to my kids. Look at some websites. If you, if, you, if that's you, you don't want to mess with it. Probably not a good choice. There you go. So uh, beating up on the doddering old man. No, I like Leo. So, so. No, sad. no, no, no. I like Leo. He's he, he's working hard and uh, he's he's done a good job <laughs> setting it up. Uh, all right. No, I do. I, I do like Leo. I think uh, I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, okay, uh, so that was, uh, I don't know, I guess I kind of feel like it's anticlimactic for the patent suit. Like, I, I'm not happy that they didn't, I, I kind of wanted Corolla to take it all the way. And I kind of feel like one of the reasons he only, he only raised, and it only doesn't sound like a lot, but in the age of where uh, a potato salad can get tons of money on Kickstarter, 500000 doesn't sound like a lot of money. But I feel like if if... I never, for example, even though I have technically some skin in this game, I never kicked into Corolla because I never felt like I was totally clear on what that, where that was going. But obviously, if he got into a real fight and that thing was starting to really go, I think people would have really, really rallied once there was a clear oh, indication where that. Back. Yeah, right. I think a lot of people would like if if it was if it was clear they were taking this to the mat and they were going to finish this. Uh, I definitely would have kicked in. I just wasn't clear what was going to happen, and now. I'm a little glad I didn't kick in because I'm not exactly clear what that money was used for and what it's going to be doing. I might try to catch Chris, a few of his shows. I'm sure he'll explain long, it. How long had that been going on? That was like a four-year, five-year I, I think it was three, but yeah, it seems like it's been going on for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I'm very happy that it's done because it, it sort of was a dark cloud over the podcasting uh, community. So at least that's super dark cloud. Yeah. I mean, that's where at the end of the day, if nothing else, you got to give Corolla major props for at least clearing the clouds and sort of letting the podcast, quote-unquote, industry continue to sort of develop and grow because it does not need that kind of stifling right now, right? It, it needs room to grow and, and sort of establish itself. So uh, major props to Corolla for, if nothing else, getting that done. Uh, hey, before we run, I wanted to uh, plug our Patreon, where you can go help us get it done over at patreon.com slash today, and I'll tell you exactly where these funds are going. Everything raised over at patreon.com slash today goes into invest in future expenses or current costs at the Jupiter Broadcasting Studios or to help facilitate the productions of shows. So, uh, for example, today is the 19th. Tonight, uh, Noah is flying out to LinuxCon. He's, that's one of the reasons he's not in here today, although I do see him idle down there. Hope he's going to fly out to LinuxCon. And when those costs come up, when he comes back, we're going to write him a check for going out there and taking care of that. Now, Noah is such a nice guy, he'll probably refuse it, but I'm still going to try to pay him for it. And the funds to do those kinds of things, to send people out to places like OSCON, like we just did, that money, just, just for that month, comes from this Patreon. Now, next month, when I've got to replace something that will inevitably fail or hire a contractor to come in and fix something which is desperately needed, the funds will come from this Patreon. Now, there, there, that is 
the, the a reason why I kind of give you that one to, one-to-one example is because I want you to understand that this is not a Tech Talk Today patron page. This is a Jupiter Broadcasting Network page. This fun, these funds go to all of the shows. And this show is a way of me spend a little time with you every day to thank you for continuing to support the network. So you can go over to patreon.com slash today. You can pledge. I have a default of $3. You can go more or less. And we also have some preset pledge levels. We have 25 left in the swag slot if you'd like to get in and have a successful transaction for the month of August. We have uh, swag that will be going out after the August payment's clear. So we have that pledge level. And you could just drop it down for the next month to a lower pledge level. I won't tell anybody. I won't. I mean, I might judge you a little. No, I'm kidding. No, it's totally fine. Patreon.com slash today. Help invest in the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. That'll wrap us up for today's episode of Tech Talk Today. I'll be back tomorrow. Wednesday, the wife Angela will be joining me in studio. We've already got some great stories to go through. And if nothing else, I'm pretty confident we're going to record it. So that will be better than last Wednesday's episode of Tech Talk today. All right, Mumble Room, thanks for joining me, you guys. You know, we were talking about kids and computers and technology. Well, there's nothing that warms the heart like an old computer commercial from Alan Alda where he feels like a kid. You know, this part of telling you about the new Atari XL home computers is that I get to try them out. They sent me everything. I feel like a kid in a computer store. And the best thing about what you see here is that everything works with everything else. In other words, it's a system. But a system that's no big deal to use. Look, with any computer, you have to learn a few new things. But Atari is going to a lot of trouble to make it easier for you. See, it's testing itself. It comes with its own basic language that's built in and uses plain, simple English. And all these extras let you do more, but only when you're ready. After I get to play with them for a while, I'm going to show you some of the more than 2,000 ways an Atari computer can help you organize and learn. And just have fun. Oh, here's a box I didn't get to yet. Well, maybe next time.